Well, we are here at Capclave, as I said, and with Connie Willis. Connie, Hi. welcome back to Fourth Fast Forward. Thank you. It's delightful to be here. And thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule as guest of honor to uh, sit with us here. This is really fun. So. Oh, good. Good. So. I think so, too. Yeah. Yeah. I love to talk to you. So, <laughs> um, so blackout, all clear, or as we're speaking, all clear just out. Two novels that are kind of one, one novel. One novel. Yeah. They're one novel. So how right. did this all happen? Right. Well, it was supposed to be one novel, and then uh, it just got a little out of hand. At one point, it was three novels, and then it's managed to squeeze back down into two. But it is really just one novel. It's not a novel in its sequel. It's not the first two installments of a 16-part World War II time travel trilogy, whatever. It is one novel, and it it won't make any sense unless you read them in order. Blackout first, then all clear. Right. Blackout, so, then all clear. Then all clear, yes. Just like it would have been during the Blitz. Exactly. The blackout. First, and then all, all they all clear, yes. And exactly. this is um, a set of your time travel, yes. which you're well known for. I think you started them with a Doomsday Book. and. Right. But you had Firewatch, and there was um, To Say Nothing, say nothing of, the, of the, the Dog, dog right. And, and, yeah. And it's, it's yeah. It's in, it's in that. It, they are freestanding novels from that. Yeah. I do not write a series, but it these two, um, I mean, Mr. Dunworthy is here. Mm -hmm. Colin is in this book. Um, and so there are some of the same characters. And then I have three, ta three historians who have traveled to World War II doing different assignments uh, in different places in different times, mm -hmm. and then who... You know, bad things happen. <laughs> things always happen to my historians, yes. and I don't know why any of them are willing to go to the past at this point. But, but uh, there, I was. I wanted to focus on the civilian parts of the war, if there were civilian parts of the war. Yeah. And uh, there was a, a great story about the wife of the British ambassador. She was in. She was in New York with her husband. I mean, in Washington D.C. with her husband, and they were trying to get money and support for the British, because. America wasn't in the war yet, and um, it was during the Blitz, and her dinner partner said to her, how is civilian morale in London these days? And she, you know, raised her frosty British nose and said, sir, there are no civilians in London these days, and that sort of is the theme of my book. <laughs> <They're>, <laughs> it's everybody's war, and, and this, is, this is all the stories that you're not going to hear in, in when you're focusing on Midway and, and the Battle of the Bulge and Pearl Harbor and, and uh, D-Day, which are all about the military parts of the war. This is the parts that the civilians played, the evacuated kids, the shop girls in London who had to clean off their counters with plaster and fallen bombs and broken glass before they started work in the morning, the people who slept in the tubes, the, the, um, all the all the different people who participated in the war. And, and I saw where they put up a put up a statue to the evacuated children. Yes, they did. Yes, recently, yes, which I thought was really neat. Which I think is really lovely. cool. The kids, you know, the kids actually played a huge part in the in the war too, and drove a lot of people crazy. <laughs> they they were all evacuated at the beginning of the war, and then but then nothing happened for that first year in terms of what was happening in England. And so by the time the Blitz came, most of the kids had trickled back to, Eng to London and were in a lot of danger. But um, it, was, it was their war as much as anybody else's, and, and uh, many of them had a glorious time. Uh, if you've seen the movie Hope and Glory, you mm -hmm. know what a glorious time they had. Um, and bed knobs and broomsticks. <laughs> and bed knobs and broomsticks, yes. And, uh, and I have two kids, Alf and Binny, who are just the bane of everyone, and who, if we could only have sent them to Germany, the war would have been yeah. over in two weeks flat. They were. Yeah, they mentioned that in the book. Uh, if they, only. <laughs> if only. They are just like a secret weapon. And, but they were great uh, characters. But though. I love Alf and Binny, and uh, I had somebody tell me yesterday that at this convention that they thought that I was not nearly hard enough on Alf and Binny and that Eileen needed to be much more strict with them. And I'm like, they're like a force of nature. Strict is not going to help. <laughs> so. Now, in the book, you have four or five different point of view characters, yeah. maybe more, because yeah. you start off actually yeah. calling a point of view character yeah. very beginning, yeah. and then the different ones you yeah. have off with the evacuated children, with the w women ambulance drivers, looking at Dunkirk, with right. the shop girls, all yeah. of that. And you go back and forth with them, not only point of view, 
going through a, the story, right. but also back and forth in time. In time, right. One of them's here at the E Day, and then one of them's back here, and then right. they're up here. And how did you keep <laughs> that all straight? Oh, I didn't. And I had a terrible <laughs> time. I would have to remind myself of who was where, when, and uh, and even my characters get confused, you know, because they, it's it's hard to imagine that someone who came to to the war three years ago will still be there two weeks from now because November 14th is still November 14th, <laughs> no matter when you got here. And uh, yeah, the whole the whole issue of of time travel it is one of those that you have to, I did charts and I did diagrams and I wrote massive notes to myself about who was where and what connection they had to everybody else. And, and I understand stuff, you so. have this nice outline all worked up oh, and then you got and the book wasn't going to end the way you wanted it yeah, to end. I, I, halfway through the writing of it, I decided that I had made a mistake and in how, in what I had intended to, to be happening. My characters are caught in, in the middle of the war and they have no communication with Oxford and no way of finding out what's going on. And so I, um, I was not sure, uh, you know, I had a plan for what was going to happen to them and then decided halfway through the book that I didn't like that. <laughs> I didn't think that was the right way to end the book. And I won't go into it because it would be spoilers if I told you the oh, decision yeah. I made. But I, so then I, that once I decided that, then I was stuck because I was writing a book without an ending, and and that's a terrible place to be. So, <laughs> so it took me another couple of years to sort that out and figure out how to work. The, the problem is time travel. It's like no matter what terrible situation you think up of going on in the future, and no matter how long it takes to resolve that situation in the future, they can still come get them on the same day, in the past. And so when you're dealing with time travel, you have to think of some reason why they can't come yeah. get them on the same day in the past. And so uh, that was my dilemma. And it took me a while to figure it out, but I did eventually. And now I'm very happy with the oh, ending. It's, oh, it's yeah. wonderful. Oh, good. Oh, good. I'm glad you like it. <laughs> it was not what I expected. Oh, good. I'm and, also glad about and it, that. And it worked perfectly. Oh, good. It fit in and it just felt nice. Oh, good. It just kind of fit together nicely like a puzzle. Oh, good. Oh, good. So, I'm glad. So that was very good. But let me ask you something about all the time travel books that always, I've always wondered about, and I'm now going to get a chance to ask okay. you. It's in, it all happens in 2060. Right. Why Oxford? Because Cambridge is the more of the science I school. Know. And why not? I know. It's like, why in England? Why not MIT or Caltech? Well, or I mean, why not in Denver? Well, I mean, if I'm going to deal with, the first thing I wrote, the first time travel I wrote was Firewatch, right. which is about St. Paul's. And since it was about St. Paul's, I thought, well, the logical explanation of who would be studying this would be somebody at Oxford. At that time, I didn't, I was in love with Oxford, and I basically just wanted to set something in Oxford. I'd been in love with Oxford ever since I read Gaudy Night by Dorothy Sayers. So... I made that decision. Probably, came, you're right. Cambridge probably would be a better choice, but but Oxford is where my heart is. And this is history. Not this was originally supposed to be history, it's not true. science. So, and Oxford is famous for its history. Yeah, but they could, have, they could have borrowed the scientists from Cambridge to build. That's true. They made use of it. That's they right. Were, yes. Yeah, that's true. But uh, once I had that, then I was sort of stuck with that. And <coughs> excuse me. And people are always asking me why I write about England. You know, if I'm not English, but. You know, I don't think writers really choose their topic. I mean, I mean, they sort of consciously choose it, but really, it's what I'm always drawn to. It's what it's what is driving me crazy, or or what I just find absolutely fascinating. And I have never had a response to anything in Colorado like I had to St. Paul's. I fell in love with St. Paul's the moment I saw it, and so I think we, you know, I try when I read books by other people to think, you know, this whatever decisions they made, this is what they were drawn to. This is what they had to write about. And if people don't write that way, I don't, you know, I hate those writing exercises, you know, where people say, you know, take three items. I'm giving you an orange, a parachute, and a horse, and you make a story out of that. I, Those are okay for writing exercises, but the real stories that you write, I think, have to come from something that's really, that you really have an emotional response to. Something you're furious about, something you're really troubled by, something you're just in love with, you know, something that strikes you as magic. 
And if you're not, I don't think they're very good stories. I mean, craft can get you a long way, but you have to really care about the stuff you're writing. It has to be the heart. Yeah, yeah. I think so. And for me, the Blitz, I fell in love with the Blitz the minute I found out about it, and I've been in love with it ever <laughs> since. It was an amazing period of history. It was history. an amazing period of history. I mean, I've heard some yeah. stories of, of England during that time from my yeah. wife's family, her mother. Uh -huh. Is English and, and met her father as American soldier during the war. So oh, romantic. She, yes, she was, you know she was lived in Winchester and, uh -huh. and her my wife's uh, great uncle was a fireman and a fire dispatcher in oh, London wow. during the blitz. Oh wow, wow! So I wish you could have talked to him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's just it's an amazing time yeah. and and I am always drawn to people in pressure cooker situations um, because you know they're being human but they're being human with the tension ratcheted up. So like on the Titanic <laughs> with two hours and 20 minutes mm -hmm. to live, you know, people's responses are different from they, what they are ordinarily. And in the Blitz with bombs raining down on you and you not knowing from day to day how long you were gonna survive, people's responses are ratcheted. They're the same, yeah. but they're ratcheted up. So, and I think you, you get ordinary people with extraordinary responses and that's what I love about, I'm not interested in good guys, bad guys, except Hitler, I think, is the best bad guy ever. <laughs> I will I will admit that. So he is a bad guy. He is a bad want to make guy. Sure there that is, this is no question in my mind. He is so bad. So bad. And I hate those people. Are well, These controversial Stalin. statements that you like oh, to make. Yes. Oh, that Stalin was worse, or that, you know, well, after all, Pol Pot killed more people. I'm like, you don't understand. Hitler was a whole different order of bad. He took all of, all of the power and organization of civilization, all the things that were supposed to be good about civilization and perverted them. That's much worse than just killing people. That's a whole different order of ickiness. And he was, you know, Churchill said at one point, he said, it wasn't that we were so right, it was that Hitler was so wrong. And I loved working in that with such a bad villain. But also um, that, you know, I, I'm always interested in people who, rather than, you know, good guy, who, good guy, bad guy, who will win, I'm much more interested in good people in awful circumstances that they don't have a lot of control over. How do they cope? And that's the plot of almost all my novels. So, yeah. you know, and sometimes they don't have a villain all, at all except like the Black Death or something, you know. And so uh, I'm interested in seeing how good people, good people make it. Yeah, I'm more and, interested in good people than bad people. And actually, in, in these books, you, you say that that because some of the historians want to go there because they want to see the heroism of everyday people. Right. Not, yes. Not the big superheroes, right. but just right. the, the heroism of, of the young girl right. going to work. Exactly. And the ordinary person who, who got in his boat and went yeah. over to Dunkirk under heavy fire with, with mines everywhere in the channel. And didn't care, but mm -hmm. was determined to help if he and could. And the guys in St. Paul's, so, the fire watch at St. Paul's, just, just sitting there waiting for the incendiaries to come down so they could try to put them out. Yeah. Well, there are people, you know, who accuse me of writing about St. Paul's because I have been a member of a church choir for years. And, and they say that I just wrote this so that I could talk about church choir members being <laughs> heroes, <laughs> which is true. There aren't a lot of situations in which church choir members can be heroes, but this was one. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and I like the idea of old ladies and little old retired gentlemen and uh, young girls and little kids being the hero. I think that's really interesting, you know. And, and it was. I mean, yeah. you know, you write about, you know, the doctors in here and, and you know, the kids and the people dragooned into driving the ambulances right. around and, right. and which all that stuff that happened. And I loved the putting on the plays. Yes. Oh, yes. Well, they did do that. And they did. Yeah. They did do that. the the uh, The actors would frequently they would go they would be performing in the West End, and then they'd go down into the tube to go home and get caught by the by the um, uh, Blitz, and couldn't leave the tube station until the raid was over, and ended up um, putting on impromptu skits and performances and readings from their plays and all kinds of stuff. So amazing. Yeah. And I love yeah. that you mentioned um, oh, what was it called the the uh, the theater group that did the, had the nudity. Yes, the, the windmill. The, the windmill. windmill. Yes. yes, we never closed. We never closed. And, we and never many were people closed. felt that they, yes, we never clothed either. <laughs> and yeah, they were well, they were heroes too because the girls had mm -hmm. the choice of either a moving and being arrested for indecency because if you were naked on stage, you had to be totally immobile, 
And so they could either move and be arrested by the police who were always standing there in the corner, or they could, you know, be hit by a bomb. <laughs> Those were your two choices. And they did great, like everybody else. They all did, did you see great. the movie they did about it? I did. Was that a Miss, great movie? I loved it. Mrs. Henderson Mrs. Presents. Presents. That was yes. great. There are so many great movies that I was lucky enough to be able to watch while I was doing the research. Hope and Glory mm -hmm. is a wonderful movie about the kids in London. And um, uh, Enigma is about Bletchley Park mm -hmm. and the, code, which you have the in, code Breakers, which I have, have in, in the there. books. And um, there are just, oh, tons of great stuff that's out. Uh, the, the one about Mrs., no, Miss somebody lives for a day. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. which was also delightful mm -hmm. about the beginning, very beginning of the war. Before we so, run out of time, let's talk about what you're working on now. What's the next Connie Willis book? Okay, well, I'm working on several things. Ah. I'm working on uh, a book about, which I had been actually working on before I wrote this, about... Um, Aliens and Roswell and UFOs and alien abduction, crop circles and cattle <laughs> mutilations and all that uh, stuff. You have fun. It's a romantic comedy, of course, oh. and um, and it has Area 51. I was heartbroken the other day because the Liberace Museum has closed in Vegas. It's, I was going to use the Liberace <laughs> Museum. I don't know what I'm going to do now because it was a big part of my book. So. <laughs> So, but I'll think, of, I'll think of a way around it. It's an alternate it, so. world. It's still open. Mm, no, no, I don't think so. <laughs> but, but anyway, that's one thing I'm working on. I'm working on a lot of short stories. I was really sidelined on short stories because I ha was under deadline and couldn't take the oh, time. Because your short stories are wonderful. So I love writing short stories. And I always write a Christmas story, and yeah. I haven't done that for a couple of years. Yeah. So, so I'm going to do one about a robot who wants to be a rocket for Christmas. Okay. Yeah. I know. Well, I'm the only person doing that. Someone has to so write this story. Somebody has to write those stories. And I'm the only one who can do it. And, um, and I have several short stories that I'm working on, including a haunted bookshop st short oh, story. So. That should be nice. Yeah, I love those stories. I love reading your short stories. So yeah. I'm glad you're still still. Oh, uh, to me, the short story is the heart and soul of science fiction. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to be writing them again. And I'm glad you are. And um, it was so nice of you to take time to sit and talk with us. And I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank it was you so much. As this usual. was fun. Yeah. Thank you. And from all of us here um, at Fast Forward and at Capclave, it's Mike Zipser saying, take care. Oh, one more thing before we go. Please remember to check us out in the coming months. We've got more Capclave interviews coming, and we've got some changes planned for both the show and the website that we hope will make it better. Stay tuned.